Uh, let me say that we're thrilled to actually have Mark Fields with us. Mark has served as president and chief executive of Ford Motor Company. Uh, in fact, uh, the last two years as, that he led the company is the most uh, profitable years in the history of the company. He also brought out the number one selling vehicle in the world, which is the F-150, which anybody here have one of those? Probably not, no. Uh, <clears throat> but what he also did was a revolutionary change in the uh, aluminum alloy and working with Klaus Kleinfeld, some of you have met, may have met before, who was uh, CEO of uh, Arconic uh, uh, Alcoa before, uh, had uh, brought out a much lighter, uh, energy efficient uh, uh, alloy that uh, a lot of us advised Mark not to bother with was plunging oil prices, a lot more environmentally sustainable and responsible, but would the market love it? Yes, those uh, big hefty owners of those, of those uh, great uh, trucks gobbled it up, they, they loved it. Mark brought out that, Mark I think at the age of um, 38, just to frustrate some of us, uh, became the CEO of Mazda, very successfully turned it around when uh, Ford had controlled it and spent, I don't know, four years or so there. Uh, in Japan with a triumphant tour of duty. And then uh, uh, right after that, he took over the Ford, what became the Ford Premier Automotive Group, the luxury cars of, of uh, Austin Martin. I guess a lot of you have those, right? No? Uh, uh, and ooh, some, and a, um, uh, Jaguars, properly pronounced. Uh, and uh, it used to be, before Mark took that over, you had to have two in the garage for repairs uh, and to have parts ready. And now that's what people say about Teslas. But, uh, but the Jaguar was a tremendous recovery as part of that group. <clears throat> Took over the Rover company, the Land Rover, and really built out and created the Range Rover, which would be enough for many of us to retire as a job well done with just that accomplishment uh, alone. And, and Volvo making it quite a, uh, a the, the big boxy, but very safe Volvo is making that a very fashionable, attractive uh, status car. And then they had to package it all together to save the, the mother company and sell painfully that, that group off. Mark turned around uh, Ford Europe, where Mary Barra, who we admire enormously, uh, maybe many of you, hopefully all of you, and Mark and I do, at General Motors, uh, had to vacate 100% of Europe, where Mark turned it around quite successfully. He then, um, as no good deed goes unpunished, they gave him the failing Ford North America to save which he came in in a very difficult program, which we'll maybe even have a chance to talk about today if, if I stop talking. It was the Way Forward program uh, that was in a very bleak period. You remember how um, Michael Moore had that Roger and Me video that was very popular? Some of us are oldest and remember. It was making fun of Roger Smith, who was running GM into the ground and closing a lot of factories, shuttering towns and things. Well, Mark made that same kind of video, but instead of pointing fingers as an outside critic of an auto company or a different company, he pointed the fingers back at themselves, saying, we're the ones who are responsible for these bad calls. We mispriced uh, the, the cars. We thought that uh, we had projections that things would sell at much higher prices and that energy costs wouldn't be where they were. And, and you're paying the price uh, for bad model choices and production issues and marketing issues. And went out on an apology tour. and and let go about half of management, but sadly almost as much of rank and file, tried to rebuild communities, give them a sense what was going to happen in the future. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then um, had to close a product line, the Mercury Division, which is a very famous old legendary line, uh, but then revived Lincoln. And if you saw in front of the, the building out front, we have an example there, a, a Lincoln Continental that uh, was uh, just built a week ago today and, and uh, shipped out here on Friday and cleaned up by these guys here in the second from the back row and, and delivered to us then uh, just in time for Mark's appearance. Thank you very much guys for getting it here. But we can talk about what that meant symbolically to the company and other great cars brought back, the Mustang and people rehired, insourcing, outsourcing issues, technology change, a lot we can turn to. But uh, rather than me say much more about all this is why don't we bring Mark forward and let him do the talking from now on, him and you. Uh, Mark, please come on and join us. Uh, so Mark, Jeff, you told me before you started that anybody that was skipping a class, you'd ensure that they get an A. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm sure you raise your hand on your way out. <laughs> yeah. so Mark uh, has, uh, you know, a lot of times when we have an executive, who's as old as this guy is, so you think, well, we introduce them. We go through a long bio of where they were 
at this company and that company and all the different tra exciting transitions and how they made the moves. Since you left my classroom, the evil Harvard, and a reckless He was one of my business school professors. And a reckless indiscretion of youth, I was employed up north. But uh, <laughs> you left the yeah. Harvard Business School, 1989. And up until now, you've been at the Ford Motor Company all this time. What's changed uh, in the auto industry this period? Two or three things. And what does that matter to the US economy or to consumers? Well, a lot has changed. When I uh, graduated in, in 89, uh, you know, I wanted to go work for a company that made something that was important to me. And I had my view at that time was Ford was a manufacturing company. But I had previously worked at IBM for four or five years before I went back to business school. Now he's on the board there, so he's come back, a <laughs> revenge of the nerd, I guess. <laughs> And, and my view was that over time, we were, going to we were going to transition to be both a manufacturing and a technology company. Now, it took a little longer than I originally envisioned, but we've gone from being a manufacturing company to a manufacturing and technology company. And where I was moving the company was also to be a manufacturing, a technology, and an information company going forward. And what I mean by information is all of our cars over the next couple of years, we're going to be connected to the internet. And all of our manufacturing assets around the world were going to be part of you know, IoT and that data. That was a rich opportunity for us not only to make the company more efficient, but also at the same time create a lot of new business models, which were very alien to us as a car maker as you think about digital services and recurring revenue going forward. So there's been a lot of change. And when you look at the auto industry today, and the advent of autonomous vehicles, uh, electrified vehicles, and also just mobility as a service, you're going to see even more huge changes around the industry uh, in the next 10 years than we would have imagined in, let's say, the last 50. Uh, Mark, as you'll recall, uh, and if you say you don't, I can produce it, as you know, your final <laughs> exam uh, in 1989 and your uh, uh, resume and I remember our discussions that you were taking a look at going into some unnamed consulting firms uh, and some technology companies that you had that in your background from IBM. I think Microsoft was one of them, but I shouldn't name names. You said no to them. Why did you say no to those places and say yes to this um, old line manufacturer with a command and control system and uh, well, I think, you know, it, all you are facing, obviously, your career, career decisions coming up, whether your first year or your second year, you've probably made those decisions already. But what was important to me at the time and, and was always important during my career is I wanted to be able to work for a company that first, I really felt comfortable with the culture and was a fit for me. Uh, because life's too short to work with people you don't really like or an environment that you don't really like. And if, if yes, compensation was important, things of that nature. But if, you, if I went solely for that and ended up in an organization where there wasn't a cultural fit for me, it wouldn't have lasted. But secondly, you know, I felt it was really important in whatever I do to have a lot of passion. And I had passion for cars. I had passion for a company that made something. And I had passion for an American company. Those, those were kind of the criteria that I had that, that that kind of pushed me and said, you know what, I'm going to come to Ford. Because at the time, it wasn't a very popular decision. Because when I was you know, way back in 89, uh, at coming out of my business school at Harvard, people were either going into investment banking or consulting. And there's nothing wrong with those, with those professions, great companies. But that wasn't what I was interested in. And that's always kind of guided me during my career, which is, Go to the, I have a saying that you go run to the fire. Because if you think about uh, back in 89, the car business was going into one of its cyclical slumps here in the US, and the Japanese were going to take over the world in terms of the car companies. And the domestic car companies here in the US were viewed as behind the times and not particularly on top of things. And so I like running to the fire. I, I, I've always liked going to those assignments and uh, situations where it wasn't the sexy thing to do, but it really appealed to me. And at the end of the day, I learned a heck of a lot, and also at the same time had an opportunity to contribute. So that's, 
that's how I ended up at, uh, at, uh, at, at Ford. And that's what kept me there for 28 years. And you know, I would do uh, recruiting every year. When I was CEO, I had different executives that were champions for different schools. And so I was the champion for University of Michigan, and I was the champion for Stanford. And I'd go to sessions like this, and I'd say, yeah, I've worked at Ford for 28 years. And you'd look at me like I had five heads. Like, well, gosh, how did you spend 28 years in, 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 in a company? What's wrong with you? And I said to myself, um, you know, in my career at Ford, I've probably had probably seven or eight different careers while I was at Ford. I had the opportunity to work in different parts of the world, work in different companies, albeit all in the same uh, industry sector, all with different management challenges. And so that kind of variety was really important to me, and I happened to have the good fortune to be able to do it at one company during the whole time. Well, how did you wind up at age 38? I, mean, I remember uh, at that time, uh, we used to have an obligatory two-week module on Japan yeah. in every course, whether or not it was accounting or, or leadership or, or production or whatever it was, because we were so unnerved by our trading partners at that time, like we are perhaps about China and maybe Korea and others today. Uh, but other than that, two weeks of something or other, what did you know about Japan to become CEO of Mazda? Well, uh, this falls into the category of you never know where life is going to lead you. And what I mean by that is, you know, I had a career plan. I was going to spend five years at Ford. I was going to do this job. I was going to do that job. And then I was going to do something else. And what happened was I ended up uh, having the opportunity to go overseas. I went to uh, Argentina first. Nobody else wanted to go down to Argentina at the time from Ford, from marketing. I started in marketing because we were just dissolving a joint venture between ourselves and Volkswagen. So nobody else wanted to go down there. So I raised my hand. I said, hey, I'll give it a shot. And so I had a chance to go down there. And then I was offered to go to Mazda to be the global sales and marketing director in Hiroshima. And so I went. And a year into the job, the CEO had some health issues. And so they said, hey, Mark, how would you like to be the CEO of Mazda? And so you know, that's allowed me, you know, you're all probably have maybe career plans. It, the answer is, it's never going to work out that way. <laughs> and just be prepared for that. You know, allow yourself, I allowed myself to think I vertically. Sure. And let me give you an example. Like when I was running Argentina, I was the managing director. So I wasn't just marketing. I had a plant. I had you know, all the functions, purchasing, manufacturing, et cetera. And then I was asked to go to Mazda in Hiroshima to run global sales and marketing. And I thought to myself, why would I want to do that? I'm just getting my general manager chops in Argentina. It's kind of a step back, although it was global sales and marketing in a Japanese company. But I said, you know what? You know, it's a, it's, it's a run to the fire situation. Mazda was almost bankrupt. I said, I'd give it a shot. And then by taking that decision, it allowed me then to become CEO a year later, which that job then allowed me you know, to have a number of other general management jobs. So just think laterally in your career and not just kind of sequentially. And it's amazing what will happen to your careers. While we're on the career trajectory, one last career question, if I could. Uh, uh, for um, not just for a CEO, but this guy particularly is annoyingly self-effacing. And unless I push him to, ask, to answer this, he won't tell us. But how was it that you got to stand beyond the pack with a very competitive pool of people that are rising up to that stratosphere to, uh, to become CEO? Your predecessor has told me a story. So if you don't tell it, I will. Um, so you know, obviously, I've had a good track record of delivering results, but doing it through teams. But one of the most important things, my predecessor, Alan Mulally, when he came in, obviously, the company was in, 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 in bad shape. I had just started the restructuring in North America about a year earlier. And Alan was all about creating a culture of transparency. Now, to set the backdrop of this, you know, Ford, right? We're 115 years old. And we had a culture that if you put bad news out there in front of your peers, or definitely in front of your, your supervisors, that was bad. That was bad for your career. 
And so problems got put under the rug. And as you know, they can only last there for so long, and eventually they become a real problem. So Alan was all about transparency, so he created this meeting on Thursdays. And he'd and come in from Boeing. He'd come in from Boeing, autos, didn't know right? anything about autos, and, uh, but he knew a lot about manufacturing. But he, he created these Thursday meetings, and that's where we were going to review the status of the business, each of the regions. And so we had about 20 people sitting around a round table, just like you have in some of the other classrooms here, kind of the big round tables. And then we had people videoing in from uh, Shanghai, uh, from Sao Paulo, and uh, from uh, Cologne, Germany. And so we had the senior team. And so the first meeting, we would show charts, various aspects of our business, and we color code it red, green, or yellow. Red was, we got a big problem and we can't solve it. Yellow was, hey, we got a problem, but we have a plan to solve it. And red was, we got a huge problem, we have no, or green was, no problem, on track. And so the first meeting, he got us all together and we presented our charts, and everything was green. <laughs> the only problem was we were gonna lose $17 billion that year. <laughs> so we were actually on track to achieving that, I guess. <laughs> and so the next week, uh, we were um, going, to, uh, preparing for the meeting, and at the time, my team and I were launching uh, a new vehicle called the Ford Edge. It's a, 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 a um, utility vehicle. And it's early December, and we were supposed to ship all of the edges that we had produced. We had produced five or 6,000 of them. And the reason we were supposed to ship them in the first week of December, and that was important because car companies recognize the revenue when the vehicle leaves the plant and then is uh, delivered to the dealers. And of course, the dealers make the money when they sell it to consumers, and we help finance at least some uh, time period that, uh, that uh, time of the uh, logistics journey. But nonetheless, it was really important to ship all these vehicles, right? Because it's the end of the fiscal year. So you can imagine, no pressure, right? <laughs> no pressure. But we had a problem with what's called the, the lift gate of the vehicle, where uh, we were having some problems with one of the struts. And so my team and I were getting prepared for the meeting, and my team showed me the chart for the edge launch, and it was green. And I said, but guys, it's not green. And they said, but you don't really want to say that, do you? And I said, well, you know, our new CEO wants to have an a, a, a environment of transparency. I'm going to give it a shot. And so we get into the meeting, and my business unit, which was North and South America, was always the first to go. So we're all sitting around the table. And I'm going through my charts, and finally the edge launch chart comes up. And there's a big, it's, it's flashing bright red. And there was dead silence in the room. And I could actually feel chairs moving away from me, <laughs> right? Because two guys in you know, dark raincoats were going to come in, take me away. There's going to be somebody else in there. And so Alan, to his credit, looked at me at, and clapped and said, thank you for your transparency. And then the next week, everybody's charts looked like a rainbow. Uh, <laughs> but that's... So, uh, uh, but they thought you had a disease. If there's going to be a trap door, you're going to disappear. Uh, yeah. I, I remember back at that evil Harvard Business School, we used to tell new junior faculty, I would never do this, but my competitive colleagues would tell new professors, oh, it's a beautiful day. There's a nice tree out there. Just go take the cases and sit under the tree, Socratic style, because we knew that's one less competitor then, because uh, that was frowned on by the senior faculty to go outside like that. So we know how people can sort of be pretty nasty that way. But I'm glad that you triumphed today. Now, you, you talked about all these technologies that changed in this period of time. Uh, electronic vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, there's uh, certainly a lot of promise behind that, and let me see. Uh, just want to get the board back. It seems to have shifted. Any... Yeah, yeah, we just keep it on that. Yeah, thanks. Here, 
joined by a first on CNBC interview with uh, Mark Fields, president of the Americas for uh, Ford Motor Company. And, and Mark, I know you guys were just here introducing the new electric transit connect as well as a redesigned edge. Uh, for you guys, this is sort of an interesting auto show because a lot of people are saying, down market is not a real good time for the auto companies, but you have that momentum, right? Well, you know, we've been investing and working our plan over the last number of years, and it's all about bringing great product to the marketplace, and our, our pipeline's very full, our market share's been growing, so we're using the Chicago show as another venue to introduce some more great new product at the marketplace. It seems like Groundhog Day for you and me. Met in L.A., and the big story that was dominating attention there was the resignation of Fritz Henderson at GM. The show here, everybody's talking about the troubles at another Toyota. HBS, I know you don't want to comment on another automaker's situation. Situation. But there is the question of how do the domestic automakers capitalize on this, for lack of a better term, steal back some of the customers that they lost to Toyota over the last 10, 15 years. How do you do that? Well, you know, again, I can only speak to Ford. And, and I think we do that by continuing to do what we've done over the last couple of years, which is stay focused on the customer, keep bringing out great products, you know, that have great fuel economy, quality, safety, and technology. Uh, the good news is since October 2008, our market share has risen every month with the exception of one, and that's on the back of bringing out great products. So we're going to continue Continue to do the same. Stay focused, not get distracted. And great product that you were bringing out at this Chicago Auto Show, just to save some time, was electric vehicles, right? Electric vehicles and hybrids, but also electric vehicles. Uh, how many months ago do you think that was? Six months ago? Guess? A year? Huh? Yeah, that was like seven, eight years ago. So you were there a long time ago. What, what happened? <clears throat> Right? You had electric vehicles, everybody's talking about it now, but there you were 10 years ago, and, and that guy, you know, Fritz you talked about, he had a predecessor, Bob Stemple, who tried to do it 22 years ago, and another Harvard guy shot it down, Rick Wagner at GM, put, took them out of the business. What happened on this front? We had these innovations. Well, what, what, you know, part of our strategy at the time was, remember, this was in the era of gas prices, 4 or $5 a gallon. So we started seeing, obviously, a big impact on our business, right? Because we have a big truck business, we have a big SUV business. And during that time period where we saw those huge uh, you know, spikes in, in gas prices, people were basically parking their trucks, uh, parking their big SUVs, and shifting to small vehicles. So our approach and our point of view at the time was that the price of oil was going to go up over time. Now, it'll, it, it would have its you know, ups and downs, but the, the trend line was, was going to continue to go up. So we invested in a, a fully uh, electrified focus, but then we came out with a number of hybrids and a number of plug-in hybrids. And for probably four or five years, we had the largest selection of electrified vehicles as defined by full battery electric vehicles and these plug-in hybrid vehicles. And what happened was, of course, gas prices went up, and then what did they do? They went down. And so the rationale, the economic rationale for people sitting you know, across their dinner table where they're evaluating what car they're going to buy and you know, what's the monthly payment that they can afford and what's the payback if I buy a hybrid versus a gas a regular internal combustion engine, all of a sudden that went out the wayside. So we were actually ahead of the curve, but our assumptions around oil prices didn't hold. And so that made that business marginal, and we weren't making money uh, on, on hybrids or full battery. Toyota vehicles. stayed with it, right? And they got up a lot of publicity for that. Toyota stayed with it. They introduced their first hybrid uh, about, uh, about 15 years ago. It took them 10 years to uh, start breaking even on the Prius line. And now they actually make a, a, a fairly decent margin on it, even in, a, in an environment where gas prices are down because they've been able to work down the commercialization curve, et cetera. So we were ahead on electrification. Our assumptions didn't quite work out. And in the meantime, what's happened is uh, with the rise of Tesla, you know, Tesla has done a very good job of raising the awareness of an electrified vehicle. And an electrified vehicle can be pretty cool. Now. They haven't proven that they can actually be a, a, an ongoing organization in terms of profits and cash flow, which is a big issue, which, you know, I'm, I, we don't need to talk about that. But in terms of being able to position an electrified vehicle in a different way, that's now helped spark more interest in electrified vehicles. 
And when you combine that with some of the enabling technologies and some of the improvements in battery uh, technology, battery density, and, and infrastructure and things of that nature, combined with increasing regulations from countries and governments around CO2 reduction, and in some cases, just outright outlawing uh, internal combustion engines or even plug-in hybrids by the year 2040 in the case of France and the UK, and China's thinking about what they're going to be doing. All those things are combining for this to be kind of a, a pivot point in the industry as we move from internal combustion engines to electrified vehicles. But that will happen over a, a fairly long period of other time. Other than the fuel prices, uh, oil prices in particular, other than that, what are the, the challenges right now for getting uh, coverage for, uh, uh, to, to, for, yeah, for more electrification, to have faster battery recharging? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of challenges and opportunities for more mass adoption of electrified vehicles. Uh, first is the battery costs. If you think about an internal combustion engine, it costs between five and $6,000 for an engine that you buy in a vehicle. If you buy a hybrid, add another $2,000 to that. So, you know, it's about seven, $8,000. A battery pack, a full battery electric vehicle, the engine, so to speak, is about uh, sixteen to eighteen thousand hmm. dollars. And so, when you look at that premium, Tesla's gonna, done a good job in creating a luxury sure. EV where consumers can afford, who can afford to buy multiple vehicles, can actually do that. And oh, by the way, they're taking advantage of uh, government incentives like the $7,500 federal credit here in the US, which they don't really need because they're affluent consumers. Right. But nonetheless, they've created that. But for mass adoption, and you know the mass adoption curves, you have the early adopters, and then the key is how do you jump over into the mass adoption? And that's where costs are gonna become really important. And so in the industry, we, uh, the cost, we, we call it cost per kilowatt hour it's about $275 cost per kilowatt hour today. Mm. For us to get mass adoption, you're really talking around the $100 cost per kilowatt hour, which the equivalent in rough guesses is maybe $60, $70 barrel of oil. But we're still probably five to seven to 10 years away from that. So battery cost is one. The second is infrastructure, charging infrastructure. Not everybody around the world has a two-car garage where you can put your car in and you have a charger and it can charge overnight. Many people live in multifamily housing and apartments and things of that nature. So you really need a long extension cord if you're like on the 30th floor and you gotta you know, charge this thing overnight. So the key is through governments and private par uh, public-private partnerships creating the charging infrastructure and I would say Europe is, is probably in the lead on that, with China not far behind. And here in the US, we, we're way behind. And so that's the second. And the third, then, is the charging time. If you think about it, let's say we get over the, the cost issue, and it's a, you know, it's a toss between you know, the cost of a, a, a total combustion engine vehicle or a battery electric vehicle. But what is luxury to people these days? Time. Right? Nobody has enough time. And so the industry's challenge is how do you get that charging time down to literally somewhere close to what it takes to fill up at the, at the local gas station, which is you know four or five minutes, maybe a little longer if you're going in and buying the Slurpee or whatever. Um, that is going to be the next challenge for the industry. And if you can overcome those, that will help adoption. And then on the forcing function side is the regulations, the CO2 regulations, and then, as I said, in some cases, the outright outlawing of the sale of internal combustion engines at some date in the future, as some countries are doing right now. One of our, our great faculty colleagues whose main day job is, uh, is a short seller, Jim Chanos, uh, has been betting against uh, 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 Elon Musk and, and Tesla, but not just on his, uh, his schedule, that electrification, we, we understand, that it's the reality, it's coming, and, and China and some other places, as you've said, uh, UK are, are accelerating the schedule, making that kind of innovation even more necessary. Uh, but uh, Tesla and Elon Musk have gotten some, uh, some attention lately on other fronts uh, for pushing a schedule where people are saying, as 
Jim Chanos would say that there's a inflated expectations, if not excessive hype. And in fact, a GM, smart mobility guy, since we can talk about getting a fight between both of these guys, don't have to bring Ford into it for the minute. Uh, it, who's right here? As we take a look at what not Tesla says about uh, battery powered cars, but what they're saying about autonomous driving. Uh, you look at odometry, you look at signage changes in technology of signage and, uh, and uh, a, a city uh, uh, traffic flow management or uh, satellite GPS advances or computer vision issues or laser technology, all these different technologies behind this. Is this GM critic right that Elon Musk is overstating that they are at this level five autonomy? What does level five mean in terms of, you know, there's right. cruise control and there's, uh, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> there's the autonomous helicopter. Yeah. yeah. And the autonomous dog. They, uh, he, he is so pushy, this dog. Uh, he always, what? I hope you have do really? other pictures in there, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, the dog takes his birthdays very seriously. Sorry about that. Well, anyhow. Well, so you this know, this only happened with Ajani here. Oh well. If you think about you know that comment around level five, I mean, uh, the the Society of Autom Automotive Engineers is kind of the body that kind of sets uh, requirements and also uh, levels of different uh, levels of technology. Level five means. You can get in the vehicle uh, in the morning, go in your garage, get in the back seat, fall asleep. Before you fall asleep, hit a button. Let's say you're, you're here in New Haven, hit a button, and you know, four hours later, you know, you're up in Boston, and you wake up in your grandma's house. We're still a long way away from that. So there's five levels of autonomy. Level five means the driver in any topography, in any weather, in any part of the planet, you will be, the vehicle will be able to navigate on its own, and the passenger will never have to uh, be able to take, need to take control. Level four, uh, which is what we were working on at Ford, was in a predefined area that's been what we call 3D mapped, that the vehicle will be able, through the sensors on the vehicle, what's called a LIDAR sensor and cameras and radars, combined with the algorithms for path planning for the vehicle to tell the vehicle you know, which way to turn and brake and things of that nature. That is, that, that's coming in the next, you know, three plus years. Level five is still a long way away because not only... What level is my Lincoln Continental right now that's right in front of me? Uh, right level now, two. Oh, level two. That's it? Level two. Well, you know. And I can't even master that yet. You have to teach me a little more, but thanks. You know. um, but, you know, essentially what uh, some of the, the, the requirements are as you think about level five, a vehicle, and this is what the industry is working towards, you not only have to manage for the rules of the road, you have to manage for the unwritten rules of the road. An example I give is, you know, let's say um, you come to a four-way stop sign at the same time as another vehicle. What I do is I'm looking at the driver's eyes and I'm kind of nudging my vehicle forward, signaling, hey, I'm going to move first. Well, what does an autonomous vehicle do on that? Or if an autonomous vehicle is on the road and you're on a two-lane road and it's double yellow lines, so you can't cross, let's say it comes across a, a, a vehicle in front that's broken down. And the vehicle is programmed never to cross a double yellow line. So you're going to sit there forever, whereas you know, here it's like, you know, go right by them. So it's those type of things, that, the regulatory environment, and just the economics of autonomous vehicles. The first uh, uh, autonomous vehicles are going to be quite expensive. That's why, you know, my view is that the first implementation of autonomous vehicles at level four is going to be in uh, ride, ride hailing services. You know, a vehicle that has a lot of uptime and can, can generate a lot of revenue, recurring revenue over a period of time to pay. Will it be that before UPS uh, or long distance drivers, speeder drivers? Uh, could be about the same time. Actually, uh, one of the uh, uh, probably uh, technologies that's almost ready for prime time is on highways, big trucks. And the reason for that is you don't, you know, it's not very complicated driving. You have to change lanes, you, you, you know, you don't have the complexities you do like, you know, driving around New Haven here or San Francisco or, or a place like that. 
Um, so you'll see that. But you know, when you look at the, the, the level of uh, you know, a, autonomous vehicles, there's a lot of hype around it. There's a tremendous amount of hype around it. And the media likes kind of talking about the hype. But the reality is you'll see level four in the next couple of years. And level five, I believe, we're still you know, seven to 10 years away from true level five capability. Uh, yeah, but it also has implications to your point. Think about city planners, right? The, the government has been talking here in the US about an infrastructure bill, right? Let's spend a trillion dollars on fixing bridges and roads and things of that nature. And yeah, it's important to fix bridges that you know, are 50 years old and that are in danger of, of, of failing. But city planners now need to think about, rather than redoing that road in downtown wherever, I may need to think about putting sensors in road signs, mm. putting sensors on traffic lights and things of that nature so that I can capitalize on these autonomous vehicles and help the flow through my cities to reduce congestion, reduce pollution, but be able to increase the flow for the, uh, for the citizens in the city. You know, as you raise those topics and uh, some of the, the global uh, differences in technology and culture and, and travel patterns and consumption and taste, and you also raise the regulatory issues, of course, your ambivalence about having uh, served on the, uh, the president's manufacturing council. There's so many large things that we can turn to later. Before we lose the point where we are right now in technology, given the way we labeled this talk about driving into the future uh, without a roadmap or something of that nature, out of fairness to uh, probably a lot of people in the room that might be interested in technology, I should stop here for the moment and ask who has questions about what he's laid out. He gave us a teaser on ride sharing and ride hailing and a little bit of an overview on autonomous vehicles and of course electric vehicles and some of the challenges. Ajani, I know you're from Philadelphia. And Grant, you're from Philadelphia too. But is that you know what it's like at a four-way stop sign. Like what happens there in a, a Quaker-inspired uh, city? We Oh, no, no, after you, no, after you. And then we all get in a collision, right? Because we all defer to the others. Whereas anybody from Boston, you know, you see that stop sign, you just gun it, right? You just resort <laughs> to whoever gets through first. So there are all these cultural differences. Questions about technology and some of the things Mark has laid out? Yes. Hi, my name is Jordan. I'm a first year MBA. Um, I was wondering, you know, we've seen the Waymo uh, settlement that just happened. It, it seems like, every, and you bought out Argo AI in the past, everybody's hunting for technologies and mm -hmm. competing, you know, within the industry. At what point do we see the industry coming together beyond sort of lobbying safety groups as Ford is part of Google is a part of, but more so in terms of technology sharing. Um, Whereas, you know, I'm seeing this, I saw this in pharma uh, with accelerating clinical trials and AI. I mm -hmm. see this in R3 blockchain with financial mm -hmm. services. When do you see the industry guys coming together and say, hey, you focus on processing, you focus on, op, um, on sensing, you focus on reacting? I think we're a ways away from that. Okay. And the reason being is it's still the wild, wild west. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, let me just put into perspective for you. Um, when you look at uh, the addressable market of the transportation business, it literally dwarfs any other sector of the economy. You know, there's a reason that Apple is interested in automotive. Now, whether they're going to build a car or just an operating system or an autonomous system, you know, it's anybody's guess. But the reason they're interested in it, if you think of uh, the Apple business, I was reading an analyst report, I mentioned this earlier today, about two years ago. And he laid out the addressable market that Apple was looking at, right, with doing business in. So you had the laptop market, yeah, that was about this big. Then you had the smartphone market, yeah, that was a little bigger. Then you had the wearables market for the iWatch, that was smaller. Then you had the transportation business. And it was literally 10 times anything else. And so you're, that, that's why you're getting so much innovation and so much interest from Silicon Valley and other parts of the world on enabling technology on the transportation sector, the automotive sector. Because even if they get a little sliver of that, even if Apple just says, you know what, I'm not going to do a car. I'm just going to do an operating system. That could be a huge business. And so you're seeing all these new competitors that we never thought we'd ever see in the auto business before Looking Ford says whole, it is bringing. Sorry look, about that. Looking at our whole value chain and saying, what piece do I want? And in the case of autonomous vehicles, the market could be so huge, not only just selling autonomous vehicles, but the real kind of gold in that is the data. 
And what kind of digital business models can you now produce in a vehicle where you know, the average person spends about 900 hours in their vehicle today, on average? And what are they doing that whole time? They're driving, right? They're focused on that. Think about 900 hours where they, hey, you know, I can watch a movie, I could, you know, buy something on Amazon, I can download a Netflix, I could, you know, buy something on WeChat, who knows? That is why everybody is, to, you, you have people like Waymo, you have some of the OEMs, we at Ford, we're doing it with Argo AI, GM is taking their approach. Can you tell us that, that story? I, I trust these people like family. Uh, the inside story is not only were you guys ahead in electric vehicles, on technology, some of the media hasn't gotten it right. You were actually working with Sergey Brin and Larry Page, yeah. right? Yeah, we okay. were. Do you know about this, what they were doing there? The dealers realized how you guys were actually ahead, and what happened? Well, we were, um, so th th hopefully that answers your question, and, and I think there's going to be five or, five or six different systems and platforms that are going to try and get their piece, and eventually it will probably come down to, to three or four There'll definitely be a Chinese one because they won't want a Western one, whether it's Tencent or Baidu or whoever's you know, going to be doing that. And they'll, the rest will be scattered in the, in the Western world. I don't think it'll ever come down to, you know, you're going to, NVIDIA, you're just going to do the chips. And, you know, Waymo, you're just going to do the software algorithms. I, I just don't see that anytime too soon because it's still early days. But in the case of Waymo and Google, we were working with them for about two years. And, um, we were trying to develop a proposal that would have equal value for each of us. Because there's lots of stories and lots of perception of, you know, the tech companies are going to take over the automotive business because once, you know, because software is going to become an even greater portion of the automotive value chain, and it will, they're expert on that, and so all the spoils will go to them. But the reality is the automobile, it is, it is a hellacious, systems integration problem in taking in software, marrying it to hardware, making sure it meets the durability and extreme uses, temperatures, all those kind of things. Car companies are really good at that. And so that's why you're seeing somebody like Waymo that says, you know what, we're not going to do a car, we'll do this operating system. And so we were working with, uh, with Google to try and come up with an equitable, you know, as we go forward, how would we each get good value? And of course, they wanted the data. And they said, well, you know, you'll just make the vehicles. And you know what happens to hardware over time. It just gets commoditized, et cetera. So at the end of the day, we tried to make it work. But I felt at the end of the day, it was not in the best interests of Ford, because I thought we were going to rue the day two, three years later where we said we gave away the store. And so that's, that's where we ended up. Other questions on the technology front? Hey, uh, my name's Shannon Delaney. I'm a first-year MBA, and I think that what's really interesting about the automotive or the automated vehicle space is the difference in opinion between the tech companies and the OEMs on the role of connected vehicles, um, and the you know the desperate need for Spectrum um, to enable that connected connectedness, mm -hmm. um, and how Google doesn't really think that cars need to be able to talk to one another or surrounding infrastructure, but. OEMs really do think that that's necessary. And so how are those conversations progressing and yeah. what role do you see for connectivity? Well, it's a great question, Shannon. And it's, uh, it's also wrapped in, into, you know, the FCC grants certain spectrums to certain industries. And so we as the automotive industry, must have been about 10 years ago, said we wanted this swath of, of uh, spectrum. And what's happened since then is with the growth of obviously the telecoms and the Netflixes of the world where they want more pipe and things of that nature. We've gotten a lot of pressure as an industry, even from the FCC chairman saying, well, why don't you give up you know, half of that spectrum that we were giving you? And our point of view was, no, we're not gonna do that because we don't know what we don't know right now. You know, uh, right now, the, the, we're protecting for a world that eventually could, make, could we have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and vehicle to what they call infrastructure communication, as well as the vehicle operating on its own? We want to protect for that, because if we give away that spectrum now, we may say, gee, we can never get vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity. And it, it may not make vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity right now doesn't make any sense, because there's no sense having that spectrum 
if you have a vehicle that can have vehicle vehicle connectivity and there's no other vehicles that it can talk to. It's, you know, it's kind of like having a, having a smartphone and having nobody to call. But that's not to say three years from now, four years from now, whatever their time frame is, an enabling technology breakthrough comes through that that makes it a, a, a consumer benefit, a safety benefit, and then we say there's no spectrum though to take, to take advantage of it. So I think it's still really early days to kind of give up that space because I think we would regret that. We'd regret it as an industry, and I think we would regret it as a society. Is there a question about uh, the source of kind of popularity for uh, e kind of autos and hybrids? Where do you see uh, that the main momentum is going to come from? Because you have so many stakeholders, is the government, the people, the consumers, <coughs> and then the ecology people. So I know some, there's some cars communities in Switzerland. They want to push for e-autos in the mountains. Mm -hmm. you, what do you see, what community is going to be the main, the strongest force pushing for the actual integration of all those stakeholders, the communities or the, the business? Well, it's, it's a great question because, you know, you have lots of different constituencies right now. You have the governments, as I mentioned, that have their CO2 requirements, which is, you know, forcing the automakers to, to not only improve internal combustion engines, which is really important. I mean, our point of view at Ford, and my view personally, is that you know, CO2 emissions is a very big deal, and it's really important for us, for the future of the planet, to reduce those significantly. But you, know, you have governments that are uh, basically dictating what's the technology that that should do that. For example, you know, let's turn to Europe, in, in Norway, in Oslo. Um, by 2019, they want to outlaw all personal use vehicles in downtown and make sure they're all uh, battery electric vehicles. That is governments basically picking technology winners and losers. Uh, and I think that's very dangerous because that stifles innovation and it doesn't let the market decide. It doesn't let the consumer at the end of the day decide what's the appropriate way to go. But I do think as you look across the world, there are certainly going to be, my view, certain parts of the world that are going to be uh, moving much quicker to electrified vehicles than others. I mentioned this earlier. Europe is uh, probably going to move faster for a couple of reasons. One is they're investing in the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure. Secondly, Europe has been much more kind of green-oriented for, for many years uh, with the initial advent of green parties and things of that nature. So there's a disposition for that. And then thirdly, the average car buyer in Europe tends to be more wealthy than here in the States or in South America or in China. China will be very close second. And the reason for that is the Chinese government has said very clearly, listen, we've missed the internal combustion engine uh, uh, development. We are not going to miss battery electric vehicles. And then what they're doing is they're fashioning their, their policies to push the market, for example, by 2019 and 20, 10% of the vehicles in China have to be what they call new energy vehicles, which are either plug-in hybrids or battery electric vehicles, and they're really pushing the battery electric vehicles. And then on top of that, they're saying, you as a foreign OEM, for you to sell battery electric vehicles in China, uh, we want you to procure those batteries only from uh, Chinese battery companies. So it promotes economic development of battery production in China. So that'll be another element. And the third element is uh, they, the cities who are major buyer of, of vehicles for their fleets and taxis and things of that nature are going to kind of you know, uh, be the initial main buyers for that. So I think it's going to be a mixed bag. And the US will be lagging behind because we don't have the infrastructure. Um, and there's, there's no plan yet to uh, invest in the energy, in the infrastructure, the supercharging infrastructure. And um, plus, you know, there's, there, there's, we have the lowest gas prices literally in the world. And if that stays the same, there's, you know, the consumers are doing the, you know, what they do best, which is I'm going to do what's right for my pocketbook. So I think it's going to be a little bit of a mixed bag across the world. Although getting back to my comment earlier around what I talked about, our view at Ford five, six years ago was the trend of oil prices was going to go up over time. The trend for electric vehicle penetration is going to go up over time for uh, a lot of the reasons that I mentioned. Thank you for being here. Uh, 
Yeah. I work at the law school this fall that's actually focused on uh, the regulation of, automotive, of HAV technology. And one of the things we've been watching really closely is um, NHTSA's use of threats um, and policy and guidance without actually moving into formal rulemaking. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that we've been trying to put ourselves in the minds of, mindset of is people in the CEO chair of companies like Ford. Um, when you look at the case studies of you know, Takata with huge you know, liabilities, um, and you're potentially going to pair that with AI and emergent behavior. You don't know exactly what's going to come next. How do you balance um, you know, this, this potential risk to the company with the fact that this is the next opportunity? And how yeah. do you sell that to a board? How do you sell that to Wall Street? Yeah. Think through things like that. Well, that's a very good point, because when you think about autonomous vehicles and you think about the challenges to adoption of autonomous vehicles, there's the technology piece that I talked about. There's the economic piece. And there's the adoption piece, you know, people feeling comfortable in, in, in riding in an autonomous vehicle, which my personal feeling is having ridden in them, I think it'll be very quick. There's a lot of people, you see the studies, uh, you know, 75% of Americans aren't going to want to get in an autonomous vehicle. My view is when they do, the first couple of times, it's going to be like um, when we first introduced uh, speed, uh, activated, speed activated uh, cruise control, right? People were like, there's no way. I'm ever going to take my foot off that gas pedal, and I'm going to have the, the vehicle automatically brake and keep me at you know, 70 miles an hour. Well, you know, it has been kind of a non-issue since, since we launched it. But the, the third element is the regulatory and the legal piece of this. And as you know, uh, the regulatory and legal piece always trails technology. Um, although I do have to give NHTSA credit, and a lot of the agencies around the world, they are being more forward-leaning on regulations um, around autonomous vehicles than they have been on any other technology I've seen for a long time. And I think the reason for it is they're, they're very cognizant of the societal benefits of autonomous vehicle, right? In the ability to have uh, handicapped people to be able to now be free to, to move around, or, you know, j there's just a lot of societal traffic benefits. Traffic efficiency. Traffic, anything. safety, all those kind of things. Um, in the case of the legal piece, um, this gets to the question, if an autonomous vehicle crashes and either kills somebody or hurts or damages some property, who are you going to sue? Are you going to sue the manufacturer of the vehicle? Are you going to sue the developer of the software code? Are you going to sue uh, the owner of the fleet? Are you going to sue the passenger in the vehicle? All those things still have to be worked out. And I think what's going to happen is because the market opportunity is so large, you know, we, we, business is all around managing risk, right? You manage a lot of different things, but at the end of the day, you have to make choices. And it's around managing risk. And in the case of autonomy, the market's going to be so huge, a first mover advantage or even a second mover advantage is going to is going to dupe any time of the day legal, um, in this case, who's, who's liable. Because that will be defined, my view is that's going to be defined when there's the first crash. And they'll figure out a way, a construct around it. But you, if we wait for it, we're, you know, the technology will be on the shelf for about probably 10 years before it actually gets into the marketplace. But um, that's kind of the calculus that, uh, that we, uh, we hold. And you know, clearly. The key is making sure that the technology is ready for prime time. That's why we have to get to level four first and prove that it works, particularly in major urban areas in these predefined mapped areas. And then you can expand from there. But there will be a crash. And that will be, that will be a very pivotal case. Hi. Um, my name is Brian Cash from School of Architecture. Hi, hey, Brian. Just didn't know where Thanks for your talk today. Okay. Um, particularly interested in kind of the architectural side of things in that um, you're talking about ride sharing as a way to scale this, this technology, either level four or level five. What kind of collaborations are happening between different disciplines that you didn't see happening with internal combustion engines? Um, like what new spaces are created in cities or what yeah. spaces are going away? Well, let me first start about the architecture of the vehicle <clears throat> itself. Um, at Ford, we were spending a lot of time on as you look at our history, we're a very uh, engineering-driven organization. So we had, we had terrific engineers, and they would come up with different technologies. And we'd kind of put them together in our car, and we'd figure out what's the experience that we can create out of these technologies that we just put together. Um, 
the way we were rethinking it is saying, what experiences do we want consumers to have? And then what are the enabling technologies that deliver that? And so it was very much a design thinking approach um, of trying to understand how consumers are using things, having empathy around how they're doing that, and then creating the architecture and the enabling technologies to deliver that experience. And so what you'll see, particularly with the rise of autonomous vehicles, for our design designers, that opens up a whole new horizon for the interior of the vehicle. Think about when you don't need a steering wheel, you don't need a brake, pedal, et cetera. We could actually design vehicles for entertainment. We could design vehicles for work. We could design vehicles for something else. And it opens up a whole new environment. And it also opens up a whole new environment on uh, um, working with others. In the Ford's case, we were working with IDEO. Uh, we were also working with the D School at Stanford you know, to kind of think differently. But to your point around others, this is where working with cities is so critical. And this is where we were focusing our efforts at, at Ford. Because if you think about cities, every mayor around the world, I don't care what political ideology they're part of, they want economic development in their cities. They want to reduce congestion. They want to reduce pollution. They want to increase the traffic flow to make you know, the life for their citizens, citizenry, uh, citizens more pleasurable. And so working with the city planners and, and saying, listen, you've designed your city to maximize the number of cars coming through roads. What if we think differently now around how do we maximize the flow of people through your city? And so think about parking structures, right? If you have autonomous vehicles, majority in major urban areas or a certain portion, you could start eliminating a lot of parking structures, create a lot of green space, um, a lot of you know, walking areas, things of that nature. And so as city planners think about the next 10, 20 years, we're trying to go to them and we, as Ford saying, what are your problems you're trying to solve? And then what products and technologies can we bring to help you solve those problems as opposed to coming up with some new product or new service and saying to the city, we're just going to do business in your city, city bounds. Now that the local dealer has left, you can tell us what the future is for dealerships. What does this mean? <laughs> uh, I didn't want to ask it while he was here. But if the <laughs> current automobiles, uh, in response to your question, he's getting to the point that we only use the vehicle 4% of the day. So you're now going to have much greater utilization of that equipment, which means we don't need to buy so much of it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to have, first off, you're going to have a spectrum. Even 10, 20, 30 years out, the world is just not going to be populated by these roaming autonomous vehicles that you'll just be able to call up on your smartphones. There will be a spectrum. There will be people 30 years from now that will still want to buy, own, and drive their vehicles the way they've had for many years. Many of them may be in rural areas uh, or less populated areas. You know, think about the farmer in Kansas. Is he's going to want to call up an autonomous F-150 to just you know, bring his harvest in, and you know, he's going to want his truck and things like that. So there will still be what I would call the traditional business. But as Jeff said, the average vehicle is used 4% of the time. It's a huge wasted asset that depreciates as soon as you drive it out of a dealership. And so what I think you'll see in terms of the auto industry is in major urban areas, you'll see less density of vehicles whether it's because it just becomes just so prohibitively expensive for somebody to own a vehicle in the city, or the cities will just outlaw them. So you'll see less density in there. That will bring the industry down. But if you think about autonomous vehicles in major urban areas, those vehicles are not going to be used 4% of the time. They're going to be used almost 100% of the time. So they're going to rack up a lot more miles much quicker than a personally owned vehicle. So that will actually turn vehicles over quickly. That will actually help the auto industry. So I can't tell you exactly you know, kind of what the auto industry will be. Will it be up 10%? Will it be down 20? So it'll probably be somewhere in that. But also at the same time, it's also going to open up a lot of new revenue opportunities, whether it's for OEMs or for dealerships. Right? Dealerships, think about this. A lot of their profitability comes from service these days. Their two biggest areas of, of profitability are what they call the back end, which is service business, or the finance business. 
they don't make a whole lot of money on, the, on selling the new car, actually. And so if you think about a world in which there's a rising penetration of electrified vehicles, um, electrified powertrains need a lot less service than an internal combustion engine, a lot less moving parts. And so there'll be less service revenue for the dealerships. But at the same time, there'll be revenue opportunities. Think about these autonomous vehicles. They need uptime is going to be absolutely key. So having the service uh, and, and ready, keeping those vehicles clean, right? You don't want every autonomous vehicle to be, you know, the five-year-old Crown Vic that you get in the cab and, you know, in the Bronx, and you know, you end up seeing what somebody had for dinner that night. That's usually a state um, trooper's car, actually. A, <laughs> a five-year-old crowd. But you know, yeah. those vehicles are going to have to be clean, right? Because those ride-hailing services are going to want to pride themselves on giving you a good experience, right? That's going to be part of their differentiation. So there'll be new revenue opportunities for the dealerships, and dealerships are literally in every city, not only here in the U.S. but are around the world. And that uptime for those autonomous vehicles is going to be really important. But the nature of the dealership business will change uh, to you know, a fairly large extent over the next 10, 15 years. Well, now, thanks to the architect's question and then moving into what this means for dealerships, it gets to community impact issues. I, I was just wondering if during the presidential campaign, uh, I didn't clear this question with you, by the way, Mark. Uh, you were frustrated. Uh, I was wondering, because this is what you actually had to say, again, six years ago. But this is not right. President Trump was attacking you, saying you're taking jobs. Jobs at once outsourced to Mexico and Japan, back to the United States. The automaker announcing it is boosting hiring at two Michigan plants. CNBC's Phil Lebeau is at Ford's Rostonville plant in Michigan with the company's president of the Americas. Over to you, Phil. Hi, Sue. I am joined by Mark Field, president of the Americas for Ford on a huge day for the company. You're bringing in 160 jobs between this plant and another plant here in the Detroit area. And what's important here is this is insourcing. You're bringing jobs that were outsourced to companies outside the U.S., bringing them back here. Tell us what these people are going to be doing uh, as they move forward on the electrification project. Well, this is a big deal because, as you said, we're not only about uh, announcing investment and jobs here in the U.S., but it's basically bringing jobs back to the U.S. for 21st century jobs. This is not the way the campaign was presenting things. So how do you counter that? Because uh, this was years ago, and you only continued more of that yeah. since. No, this was this was four or five years ago. So this is well before you know Trump started talking about uh, you know the issue of of outsourcing and jobs. And it was very interesting when when Trump announced he was running for uh, president back in June of 2015. He called Ford out. He called us out because we were building a plant uh, in Mexico. And during the whole campaign, he was using us as a little bit of a punching bag for, I would say, um, I guess in his term, fake news on what we were doing and why we were doing it. And so our approach during the campaign was to be very factual and talk about the facts and talk about the facts, the reason we were building a, a plant in Mexico was we were going to ship two cars that were produced in a plant in the US down to Mexico and replace those with uh, two trucks and actually add jobs here in the US at that plant. But nonetheless, you know, facts are stubborn things. And sometimes in the fog of political campaigns, they get, they get, uh, uh, they get misrepresented. And the key for us was just being factual not getting emotional about it. But he didn't listen to you. But he didn't. But that's when you have to continue. You have to have a lot of emotional resiliency. And you have to continue to get the facts out. So how'd this work out for you? <laughs> oh Let me raise the sound here. Is you're on the uh, lawn of the White House, and somehow you became a uh, Grow investment and jobs uh, here in America, in American industry, and of course in the automotive industry, which is what we talked about this morning. As an industry, as an automotive industry, we employ many people across America, good paying jobs from the people that work in our factories to manufacturers that support our plants with parts to our wonderful dealers who are literally in every community across America who helps uh, sell and service our vehicles. That's the head of Chrysler. And we're very encouraged by uh, 
the president and the economic policies that uh, that he's forwarding. I think as an industry, we're excited about working together to, with the president and his administration on tax policies, on regulation, and on trade to really create a, uh, a renaissance in American manufacturing. So uh, maybe, Mary, you want to say a few things? Yeah, just uh, yeah, I remember that. General Motors was there. But somebody didn't tell Chrysler about the dress code, I guess, at the White House. Uh, <laughs> no, they don't, uh, he, he doesn't care. <laughs> but uh, what, what good did it do being part of the President's Manufacturing Council? Well, here's the thing. Obviously, as, as, as business, you have to be very practical and you have to be true to your values. So when we, I was invited to come on the Manufacturing Council, I thought that was a great opportunity to, to continue to engage with the President and to continue to talk about the facts. Because what's really important, as uh, uh, I believe, as business, is whether you agree with an administration or you don't agree, it is really critical to engage. If you don't engage, you're abdicating uh, basically what the, what the uh, end game is going to be. And so the approach was we're going we're to state the facts. We're, we both have the same thing in common. We want a healthy American economy. And how do we as a company help contribute to that, but at the same time make sure we, 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 we represent the fact that we are a global company and we do business around the world? Was it right for them to dissolve? I think it was absolutely right for them to dissolve because I think the original intent of the uh, manufacturing uh, committee was the right thing. I give the I gave the president a lot of credit. He wanted to create these 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 committees to get input, and he did listen during those sessions. But when the intent, the original intent of the committee, becomes something very different, then you just got to say this doesn't work for us anymore. And once that happens, then again, you don't abdicate and say, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna engage. There are other ways to continue to engage, whether it's through industry associations or just direct lobbying, but it's really important to continue that engagement. Any final comment? Uh, thank you, Mark. Question, uh, complaint, yeah. Uh, th thank you for coming. Uh, you I bet. guess, uh, you know, you talked about a lot about the disruptions, you know, in the industry, in the uh, adjacent industries, uh, services, and so on. I guess if you were an entrepreneur coming out of business school, which of these would, would attract you? Or which one, which one of these do you think has a lot of profit to come? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Let's cut right to the heart of it. Where, where can I make the most money? Is it NVIDIA that's the chip maker for autonomous vehicles? Is that the... Well, I think, first off, as you think about the automotive industry, if I would have asked this question five years ago, are any of you interested in the automotive industry in any form or fashion, I probably would have gotten one hand. If I ask the question now, I probably get a lot more. And, there, and there's a reason why, and I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and the feedback I've gotten from VC firms, et cetera, is, et cetera, is they have never seen so much interest in the automotive business before. And the reason is, as I mentioned for, earlier, the, the addressable market. So I think there's ample opportunity, whether it's in autonomous vehicles. I actually think, specifically to your question, the biggest opportunities with the best margins are going to be the digital business models that you can figure out of how do you meet an unmet consumer need in a, 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 an environment where a person is going to be for a period of time and you can create some kind of service or some kind of entertainment or something that uh, they're willing to pay for. And even if it's a very small amount, the law of numbers is going to multiply to make that a really big opportunity for you. You know, uh, given we're at the end of the hour, it's uh, really frustrating that I can see a number of hands are ready to jump up. I, I know the end of the hour and a half, but OK, thanks. Uh, but uh, there's, there's so much more that we would love to show you. They're just out of time. I'd love to show you the, the Mustang that Mark constructed on top of the Empire State Building, literally. <laughs> Uh, which we have to show you and how startled some tourists were and they just saw it up there. But they, they built it up there, right, in 50 mile an hour winds overnight uh, to uh, celebrate the, the relaunch of the Mustang or what the thinking was is still keep staying in the luxury business, what they've done with some very cutting edge technology in, in Lincoln and elsewhere. But 
Sorry, we're out of time. We won't give you any of the commercial sales videos that we all had ready for you. But Mark, in terms of the real substance, the technology, the regulatory issues, the social issues, and even the political here at the end, uh, it, 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 they're all fascinating, but they're all in the shadows of the leadership model you presented. You said so much just about consensual leadership, but also visionary leadership, and about integrity and transparency, and you've already modeled that all the way through. If I knew you guys better and that guy wasn't taping things right now, I would say uh, that there probably could be an announcement by late next week about what Mark's going to be doing next. But since I can't say that with him taping it, I won't say that. Is that right? But uh, Mark, is, uh, there's uh, many more exciting adventures coming his way. And we hope you stay a part of the Great. Yale School of Management fold and stop those visits to Harvard, Michigan, and Stanford immediately. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Mark. Thanks, All right, Mark. Thank you. Can you cover everything? Yeah. I had the, good. <laughs> I introduced Ajay Jain. Ajay is our dean. Very nice to meet you. You bet. You Not bet. Uh, he's, our, he's a national he treasure. No. <laughs> Ajay, we, Ajay we, we, we stole from Wharton and hit the, hit the jackpot, but operations oh, is his expertise. How long so. have you uh, been, I've been here? About five years. Oh, great. The, the school is gorgeous. It, the classroom space is Especially. Yeah, it is. It is yeah. really spectacular. It's the yeah. first time. Every time I no, because every time I've done a class, by video video. Beam. Yeah. I we always video. Those screens. So, oh, hey, thanks uh, so much. No, no problem. Yeah. Really yeah. So. It's okay. Oh, good. Yeah, thanks. Oh, really? Sometimes yeah. this thing reverts to that other screen. How do you bring yeah. it back when it when that goes yeah. to that? Yeah, yeah. In Sterling Heights, yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Go back. Oh, and go more. back. Yeah. It's just that simple. Did you see that? Did you know that? Watch, watch here. Some. I must have hit that. Yeah. Just just go back. That. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Could you stand over here just one second, Mark? They would like a picture with Ajani and you. Uh, three of us. Okay. okay. That's okay. My wife always told me not to be photographed with this guy, too. Thank <laughs> you.